Hello and welcome. Today we will be responding to a space denialist and educating him on a few basic facts about spacecrafts. We will go over orbits, the launching of spacecrafts, thermal protection, and re-entry. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. When launching any rocket that is designed to leave Earth's atmosphere, a certain speed has to be reached to achieve an escape from Earth's gravitational pull. This is called escape velocity. The escape velocity of Earth is 11.2 kilometers per second, a speed of roughly 25,000 miles an hour, or Mach 33. And this speed has to be obtained to be able to enter space without being pulled back down to Earth because of gravy T. You are correct in saying that the escape velocity of Earth is about 11.2 kilometers per second, but you are incorrect in your assertion that all rockets have to hit this speed in order to stay in space. You are also incorrect in saying that spacecrafts must break free of the gravitational pull of the Earth in order to, once again, stay in space. To address this, let's look at the International Space Station. Despite what you may think, the International Space Station is not free from the gravitational influence of the Earth. The gravitational influence on the International Space Station is actually about 88.54% of what we feel down here on Earth. And yet, despite that fact, it is still very successful as a spacecraft. In fact, most satellites launched will never leave the gravitational influence of the Earth. In regards to your assertion about the speeds that are needed, the International Space Station is not traveling at escape velocity. The International Space Station is orbiting around the Earth at around 4.7 miles per second, or about 7.6 kilometers per second, a difference of about 3.6 kilometers per second when compared to escape velocity. So. If the International Space Station is under the influence of Earth's gravity and not traveling the 11.2 kilometers per second that you asserted, then how does it stay in space? Well, consider this. If you have a ball and you throw it sideways, it's going to curve and hit the ground. But what if we threw that ball fast enough that the curve of its arc matched the curve of the Earth? Well, the ball would always be curving towards Earth but Earth would always be curving away just as fast, and it is at this point that we have a successful orbit. In the end, that's all the rocket does. It gets satellites high enough to avoid the drag of the atmosphere, and it gets them going fast enough where they can maintain a stable orbit. And when doing the math, it all works out to be something that agrees with NASA and my own observations on the matter, links in the description, and not with your assertions. Here, you can see the equation where the centripetal force due to a curved path, like an orbit, is equivalent to the gravitational force between the masses of the Earth and the International Space Station. Plug in the values, crunch them out, and we get an answer of 4.7 miles per second, or 7.6 kilometers per second, and not 11.2 kilometers per second. In short, you do not have to be outside of the gravitational influence of the Earth to stay in space, and 11.2 kilometers per second is complete overkill. Coming back into Earth's atmosphere, the process is called re-entry. This is supposedly the rapid breaking of the spacecraft caused by it hitting the Earth's thicker atmosphere, which decreases the velocity drastically from the orbital speed of 9.4 kilometers per second in low Earth orbit. That is completely incorrect. I want to know where you're getting your figures, dude, because as mentioned previously, orbital velocity is around 7.6 kilometers per second in low Earth orbit, not 9.4 kilometers per second. Look, you may think Google was built by the Illuminati for the Freemasons and the Lizard People, but do try using it sometime. You may find it useful. Or to put it another way, many times faster than a speeding bullet. Or to put it another way, not as fast as you asserted. So after the launch, our rocket pops into orbit with its brand new shiny paint job and all its fancy bumper stickers intact. It's now ready for its debut on the world's media platforms in all its glory. 
It almost sounds like you're making the claim that the space shuttle never had any damage done to it during the launch phase of its mission. If this is what you are suggesting, then you are simply incorrect. During STS-118, some of the heat tiles on the belly of the orbiter became damaged after they were struck by a piece of insulation that came off the external fuel tank. During STS-107, the leading edge of the wing was also hit with foam from the external tank, only this time it resulted in the total loss of the vehicle and crew. During STS-27, a blade of insulating material from the nose of the solid rocket booster impacted the wing on the right. This resulted in damage to the heat shielding and resulted in scaring the sh** out of the crew members on board the orbiter. In short, there have been plenty of cases of damage done to the orbiter during launch. To claim otherwise is to showcase your own ignorance on the subject. On the other hand, when the spacecraft encounters the Earth's atmosphere on the way down, it heats up so much that the NASA engineers have to cover it up with special heat-resistant ceramic tiles, so the thing won't melt on re-entry, due to the extremely high temperatures of the carpet burn. Sorry, did I say carpet burn? I meant to say plasma burn. Dude, that joke was bad, and you should feel bad. So how come it's traveling at the same speed through the same atmosphere, at the same angle, and in the same direction of the Earth's rotation, yet no provision is made for protection on the ascent, and the spacecraft is unharmed when it reaches orbit. Because they are not traveling at the same speed through the same part of the atmosphere at the same angle. Despite what you seem to claim, the stresses of launch are much less than the stresses of re-entry, but we will come back to that later. First, I want to point out that I am surprised that you made such an idiotic claim of no protection during launch while at the same time showing the fairings that protect the payload during the launch. Do you watch your own videos before you post them? Rocket fairings encapsulate the satellite being launched and are jettisoned at a sufficient altitude where the atmosphere is no longer an issue. Here we see the testing of the fairings for the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Here we see the fairings being jettisoned off of the Electron rocket, and here we see the fairings being jettisoned off the Atlas V rocket. There are plenty more examples of this. So to claim that no provision is made for payload protection during launch is to once again showcase your ignorance on the topic. And as for the space shuttle, it's not as fragile as your average satellite and was designed to deal with the stresses of launching into orbit. In short, no fairing needed and we will tie this all together with re-entry after the next clip. I'll just pop this picture on the screen while you fanboys try to work out an answer. Time's up. Remember to put your names at the top of the papers. If you have any trouble with this, just ask the teacher. Wasn't that hard, dude, and this is where we tie it all together. The X-15A experienced damage while traveling at Mach 6.7, which is 5,140.7 miles per hour, while traveling at an altitude of 102,100 feet, or about 19 miles. The numbers are important because we are now going to compare them to the space shuttle during the launch phase of its mission. The orbiter would be traveling at 2,500 miles per hour at 21 miles in altitude, 3,200 miles per hour at 35 miles in altitude, 4,200 miles per hour at 54 miles in altitude, and to bring it past the Kármán line, 5,500 miles per hour at 62 miles in altitude. So at roughly the same altitude of the record-breaking flight of the X-15A, the shuttle was traveling a little less than 48% the speed of the X-15A. In fact, the shuttle doesn't hit the X-15A's 5100 mile per hour speed until it's almost past the Kármán line. At that altitude, the atmosphere is thin enough to not cause the damage that we see on the X-15A. It's also worth pointing out that the X-15A was working with an experimental ablative coating, and this prevented the aircraft from cooling as originally designed. The space shuttle, on the other hand, was made with better materials for thermal management, materials not used on the X-15A. And speaking of thermals, this leads us right back to re-entry, because you claim that between re-entry and ascent, the orbiter is traveling at the same speed 
through the same atmosphere, at the same angle, and in the same direction of the Earth's rotation, yet no provision is made for protection on the ascent, and the spacecraft is unharmed when it reaches orbit. So let's go ahead and address that now. We will stick to the space shuttle here since we already showed that regular satellites are indeed protected during the launch. So back to the shuttle. Here is a diagram that shows the difference in speed compared to launch and re-entry. At 60 kilometers in altitude on launch, the orbiter is traveling at roughly 1400 meters per second. During re-entry, it's traveling at roughly 4400 meters per second at the same altitude, which is 3.14, or pi, times faster. At 80 kilometers in altitude, the discrepancy is even worse. On launch, the orbiter is traveling at roughly 1700 meters per second. During re-entry, it's traveling at roughly 7400 meters per second at the same altitude, which is 4.35 times faster. So no shit, it's going to need more thermal protection on re-entry than it will need during the launch. So your apparent claim that the launch phase of the mission has the same stresses as re-entry is 100% incorrect. With that, I have left my paper that explains all of this on your desk. The name at the top is Red's Rhetoric. I hope I get a good score.